All right, Brown v. Kendall. So this case is basically one of the touchstone cases you're going to learn about in torts. Uh, torts meaning like car accidents, ambulance chasers, products liability, uh, you know, pretty much all of the TV lawyers. Um, so to understand Brown v. Kendall, we really need to go back, way back, further back, all the way to the beginning, before the beginning. Okay, maybe not that far. So um, we're going to go to England uh, around, I don't know, the 11th century-ish. So the United States is a common law system, which basically means we only make decisions by stacking precedent on one another so what i mean is hey one case is resolved one way a future judge has to follow that case and not just go astray uh, or has a really good reason to do it otherwise it's going to get appealed to the higher court <clears throat> where was i england okay so england back in the day in anglo-saxon england was basically like a bunch of little communities called shires um, that were the court system and it was really like 12 guys uh, sitting on pews and watching two other guys duke it out in the middle, and then they say who who won the argument. Uh, then the Norman Conquest happened. Um, uh, they got invaded by uh, kind of like French Vikings, you know, the Normans, who really knows what they are. Um, and then the, the Angevin period followed that, where things got standardized. But the point is, through all these 300 years of English history, property law developed, but, you know, crime a little bit, but torts, individual wrong, not at all. Um, so remember, think about it as in crimes are, are something that, you know, the state will prosecute. Torts are something I sue you over uh, because you hurt me um, and the coffee was too hot. So anyway, now this brings us to 1850, Brown v. Kendall. We're at a dog park. Uh, Brown and Kendall are walking their dogs. Uh, their dogs start tussling. And then um, the defendant grabs a nearby stick and just starts whacking the dogs to get them to stop. Uh, 1850s. Um, and he ends up whacking the plaintiff square in the eye. So the plaintiff sues. And actually the defendant loses at the lower court because the lower court gave the jury um, jury instructions, which by today's standards are just incorrect. The instructions he gave them are, frankly, I'm reading them right now, and they're so complicated that, you know, if this were a recipe to make uh, uh, Silly Putty, I, I wouldn't trust a chemist uh, to figure these suckers out. So so the defendant appeals to the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, and the Supreme Court holds that, uh, yeah, lower court, you kind of fucked up there. Um, those instructions don't make sense. Uh, we're going to remand for a new trial. That just means we're going to send it back down. you got to follow our rules. So the Supreme Court of Massachusetts opinion in Brown v. Kendall is so important for two reasons. First, it created more or less the differentiation between intentional torts and negligence. So intentional torts for the plaintiff to win, they have to prove that the defendant intentionally harmed them. So you intentionally poked me in the eye with the stick. You intentionally uh, uh, drop that door on my ba baby. You intentionally blew up fireworks next to me. You intentionally spilled hot coffee on my baby. Um, and then negligence, which is the much more common uh, I, uh, type of tort that you'll see today, is that um, you owed me a duty of care and you, you breached that duty. So... Basically, you didn't do something on purpose. You just you just acted aimlessly and 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 hurt me. You know, you were walking around listening to your to your Walkman, and you 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 were you were kind of dancing and and you know, whoops, up spilled the coffee on my baby. You know, you didn't do it on purpose, but you know, I I can I still suffered a harm while my baby suffered a harm. Uh, whether I suffered emotional harm is another issue. But I, I should be able to get damages from you if I can prove that. This gets into the other reason why Brown v. Kendall is so important to torts. Um, it gave us the definition of ordinary care, which is the degree of care prudent, cautious person would use based upon the exigency of the circumstances to guard against probable danger. Uh, that's a word, salad. But as uh, one of my professors said, you got to still eat it, you know, to get big. So we, we don't want to allow people to judge for themselves 
the amount of care and caution we should exercise in our everyday tasks to not harm others. Instead, we create this, this Herculean high standard for us to live up to of the, the reasonably prudent, cautious, ordinary person. So, for example, you and I decide we're going to go buck hunting on my daddy's John Deere uh, at night in the cornfield. And um, I think I think it's it's a good, cautious speed to go about 25 mile per, per hour on that sucker. And you think eh, we could go like 45 miles per hour on that sucker um, and still get a shot off on them bucks. Uh, if we end up hurting someone, like let's say I, I slam on the clutch real fast and you go flying over the handlebars and break your neck and then you want to sue me, you know... I'm going to be saying, hey, I was going 25 miles per hour. I thought that was that was fast enough. Well, maybe the jury will come back and be like, you know what? When I go buck hunting in my papa's field, I know that 10 miles per hour is really how fast you should be going not to fly off the, fly off the, the railing. Um, and, you know, as a reasonably prudent woman, more reasonably prudent than a reasonably prudent man, it's probably reasonable to think so, but the law doesn't really care about that either. It's just reasonably prudent person.